Hello, this is Captain Chaudhary. Welcome to my uh, third lecture, third video on polar navigation. In this particular video, I want to talk about the facilities which are available. Of course, it is adventurous to be there, but there are a lot of things IMO has done. So the ships proceeding to polar areas can do better passage planning today. Last time I told you, there were uh, this six two-way routes established by IMO. Uh, in addition to this, there were six precautionary areas which were there and three areas which were not to be entered. That means the areas to be avoided. This is in uh, Bering Sea and Bering Strait area. Before I talk about the Bering Sea, I would like to talk about the Bering Sea SRS. Bering Sea SRS is like uh, the ships which are uh, navigating uh, in those areas. These areas are, you know, uh, uh, way more than 70 degrees north, but south of the demarcation line uh, that is uh, stated for Arctic waters uh, in polar code. So uh, that means the polar code will not apply there. But uh, the latitudes being, you know, like from 70 to 73, lot of uh, uh, Climatic conditions which prevail in polar areas will be found here. Say, for example, prolonged daylight, prolonged night time, prolonged twilight time, difficulty uh, because of uh, uh, visibility, difficulty because of the fog, etc. in that area. Ice, of course, is there in that area. So this Berent SRS is to be followed by the ships which maneuver with difficulty, say, not under command, restricted in their ability to maneuver. If they are carrying oil, or if there is any defective na navigational system. So these ships are supposed to report to Wardo uh, VTS center or Murmans VTS. So the ships which are navigating in these high latitudes, they should be aware about this uh, 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 VRS system which is placed. I have been showing you the map uh, where the entry to the Arctic is done through North Atlantic. So we are going to North Pole via North Atlantic. So what I'll do is now I will gradually turn the earth so that now we will enter the North Pole or Arctic area through the Bering Sea. So as I said, I will be talking about the routing measures which are taken in these areas, the navigational aids which are available, the communication possibilities in these areas. Uh, like you are not on the other side of the world where nothing is available. So uh, many uh, things will help a mariner to do the appropriate passage planning. So I was talking about the six two-way routes and six precautionary areas plus three areas to be avoided. You have the shallow waters, you have unknown unsurveyed waters or you might have the areas which are ecologically important. They have to be preserved. They don't want the ship to navigate over these areas even if they would be safe. So restricting the ships to these areas will enhance the safety. Moreover, the ships which uh, uh, frequently pass over these areas would mean that the area indirectly is surveyed by the ships. Right? If you uh, get some uh, a shoal or uh, a patch which is not apparent from the chart, you can report the matter to uh, hydrographic department that will make uh, the chart better and better. So uh, that is also an idea. Plus, these routing measures which are provided uh, are made in such a way that in case you have to do collision avoidance and if you have to take action there is sufficient area available for maneuver. Plus to avoid the ice uh, the uh, flexibility is provided to the ships so that they can avoid the ice also and they can also remain within the areas to be avoided has uh, multiple things in mind say for example uh, preserving uh, the ecological importance of that area. You know and like not causing the damage to the underwater uh, marine uh, life or marine uh, uh, existence you know by the ships uh, going in those areas plus those areas might be uh, not very well surveyed the system is voluntary but it is recommended that the ships of 400 gross or more uh, use this area now the Eastern Bering Sea, uh, we must understand that this is the area of rather shallow water and rather less surveyed. So this area should generally be avoided by a mariner. Also, it is urged that all the administrations, all the countries whose ships are likely to come to these areas, they advise their mariners that uh, the information regarding this six-way routes 
and six precautionary areas and three areas to be avoided should be found from IMO document NCR 5 slash 3 slash 7 and 5 slash 3 slash 8. So latitude, longitude of these routes and precautionary areas etc. areas to be avoided are uh, given there. So uh, mariners must, whatever charts they have, they should do the correction and establish these routes on their charts. I had also told you that the IOMO assembly in November, December 2019 had urged the nations that even if their ships are not under uh, SOLAS, they should be uh, encouraged to follow these traffic measures. There are various constellation systems established by different countries. Uh, providing global coverage or regional coverage. So if you talk about Baidao or BDS system, this is a Chinese system comprising of 35 satellites which became operational in 2020 by 2020 and uh, this gives a global coverage. This was uh, earlier called Compass. Then you have uh, GLONASS which is provided by Russian Federation. It has got 24 plus satellites. Then you have Galileo which is provided, Galileo constellation is provided by European Union. Uh, this is supposed to have started in 2016 and uh, ended by 2021 and uh, at the end of 2021 there are uh, 24 plus satellites, once again global coverage. Then <clears throat> a GPS of course everybody is well versed with a GPS constellation system by uh, US. Then you have IRNSS and Kasi Zenith, uh, regional GNSS system from India and Japan respective. Then you have SBAS that is satellite based augmentation system. They can always be errors, they can always be uh, a scope for the correction. So these corrections are supplied by this SBAS system that is satellite based augmentation system so that the accuracy by GNSS can be even better. While the ship is in North Pole, uh, you uh, will not have a satellite passing overhead. There is a reason for that. And to understand that, uh, I will explain you a simple uh, grid circle principle. Say for example, if this is the Earth, and this is equator, this is the axis of rotation. Uh, at equator, the plane of satellite's orbit, what angle it makes, what angle it makes to the equinoctial or equator. The angle made in case of GPS is 55 degrees. It is 64 degrees 8 minutes in case of GLONASS and for uh, Galileo it is 56 degrees. So uh, what happens is there is a principle like uh, if there is a great circle that is drawn makes an angle. The plane makes an angle of say uh, 55 degrees. Then latitude at which the satellite will reach will also be 55 degrees. That means this angle is equal to this latitude, which means that a person who's at the pole, who's got the horizon as the equator, the person who's on the pole has got the equinoctial as horizon and he will find the at maximum altitude, he will find the satellite at the angle, which is the angle of crossing at equator, which means that the maximum altitude uh, to which a GPS satellite can be seen from polar areas is 55 degrees for GLONASS it is 64 degrees 8 minutes and for Galileo it is 56. This means uh, the vertical positioning will not be all that accurate as compared to horizontal positioning. The fact remains that at uh, near the horizon you are going to get several satellites because there are at least four constellations working in. Uh, global GNSS system so you will have a lot of satellites but none of the satellite is going to pass overhead at pole the maximum altitude is limited by the angle at angle that is made at ascending node now let us understand the influence of uh, gravitational field on positional accuracy so uh, gravitational field that is a gravity force and the altitude at which the satellite is maneuvering and the linear velocity of the satellite etc they are interconnected here is the earth and uh, let us say a satellite is moving at this altitude this is the height and this is the distance from the center of the earth uh, this is capital M 
and the mass of the satellite is small m. So there is a gravitational pull towards the center of the earth that is indicated by gmm upon r square. This is the radius of the orbit. But this has to be equal to the centrifugal force that is m v square upon r. Now what happens is one r gets cancelled here, the mass of satellite gets cancelled. That means that there is no importance of mass of the satellite. Considering the g and m to be constant, there is a relationship between the velocity and the radius of orbit. So where the areas are not surveyed properly or the information regarding the gravitational field is not known accurately, which typically uh, uh, can be true for polar areas, the accuracy of GNSS position fixing would be affected because of this. Solar flares and other uh, uh, space weather events, they are likely to affect the ionospheric interference. Now because of this what will happen is the phase and the amplitude of the signal is likely to change and that is going to affect these ionospheric interferences will have higher influence in high latitude or polar areas. What is the principle of GNSS compass? Now GNSS compass is mandatory for a ship that goes beyond 80 degrees latitude as per polar code. Now this GNSS compass has got uh, say two antenna which are placed on the ship, rigidly placed on the ship at a known distance, say, say uh, approximately about 50 centimeters. Now these antenna receive the signals from uh, a satellite whose position is supposed to be for the time being supposed to be uh, known. So when the signal comes and attacks these antenna, the phase difference which is recorded on these antenna is measured. The phase difference between uh, the signals which are received on these antenna with the position of the satellite known will uh, be able to give the orientation of these antenna. Now accuracy of the direction measurement would depend on how well you have received the GNSS signal. What is the distance between the two antenna and how accurately you have measured the distance between the two antenna? Well, there are different systems available in the market with varying sophistications. You have various GNSS available for a better positional accuracy. You have GPS, you have GLONASS, you have Galileo uh, and you have uh, uh, BDS system of China. Let us understand what is the role of inertial navigation system in GNSS position fixing and direction providing. So for that let us first understand what is this inertial navigation system. Basically inertial navigation system has got a horizontal, just to understand the basic principle, it has got frictionless horizontal platform and there is this weight that is placed. You have springs here, you have springs here. Now when the ship accelerates this mass tends to remain behind in space because of the frictionless platform and this spring gets elongated. The elongation in the spring is proportional to the force that is exerted because uh, uh, there is the spring constant which we know and we can find out the force that is generated. Force is equal to mass into acceleration and if we integrate acceleration with respect to time uh, we tend to get a velocity and once we integrate the velocity with respect to time, we'll get the distance that is traveled in space. So if we have uh, this platform in the direction of y-axis and then x-axis, we are able to find out the course made good and speed made good. You know? So that's why we say that inertial navigation is capable of providing the accurate DR. But the condition is the initial position has to be provided to the inertial navigation system. Now, uh, the uh, similar thing can be acquired, similar information can be acquired with the help of so-called accelerometers which are used more and more on the ship to find out the stresses, etc. So imagine uh, we have uh, this inertial navigation system working in three dimensions, say for example x, y and z axis. So with the help of accelerometers, we are able to get linear displacement in space that is x, y and z axis and with the help of uh, gyros that uh, we have along these three axes we are able to get information in respect of roll, pitch, heave etc. 
Let us now see what is the importance and role of this GEO satellites or geostationary satellites in uh, polar areas. First of all, let us understand what are these geostationary satellites. These geostationary satellites are in a way placed <coughs> over the equator. They uh, are in their orbits traveling at the same time in such a way that they are located over a specific area. That means they are geostationary. They are stationary with respect to the earth that is underneath. And now we also know that the speed of the satellite and the altitude of the satellite has got relationship uh, which I explained a few minutes uh, earlier. Now if you have a geostationary satellite uh, which is above equator which is stationary with respect to the earth underneath it needs to have an altitude of something like 35,786 kilometers. Now uh, this satellite of this altitude travels at a certain uh, linear velocity so that the equilibrium is maintained between the centrifugal forces and the gravitational forces. Now this satellite has got a field of vision. FOV as they say field of vision. If I draw the tangent from here it will tangent the earth at a latitude which is about 81.3 degrees. That's called field of vision. So this entire uh, 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 portion of the earth is in a field of vision of the satellite. These uh, geostationary satellites they support voice, data, photo, video etc. to uh, a particular area to which they are supposed to cater. Now this information that is provided by these geostationary satellites as I told you has got a limit maximum limit of say 81.3 degrees and as I said this field of vision or this area to which these signals or data is provided is sometimes curtailed to about say 70 degrees or 75 degrees. The examples of geosatellites is Intelsat, Inmarsat, Panamsat, etc. In order to ensure the safety of navigation in a particular area, it is not only important that the navigation is done with safety, it is also important that the vessels are monitored by some shore based station. So the land-based stations aware about the shipping or uh, the location of the ships in the polar areas is also equally important. So what is the contribution by AIS? So the vessels which are fitted with AIS transceivers, they are received by shore-based stations. You know, but the only problem is the maximum range that can be utilized in this is uh, say about 20 miles. While the ship is not within 20 miles, probably there might be uh, satellites which would receive uh, this AIS information. Now the information that is acquired by the satellites and by this shore based stations, you know, the information can be integrated in respect of the shipping in the polar areas. And uh, there are various internet service provider stations, you know, who will probably have this integrated information and they would provide this information to the shipping. So if there is a ship or a shore based station, which has got compatibility with this internet service, you know, they can have this information. So long as the information in respect of uh, the ship or the shipping in the polar areas is available to the people who are watching uh, these ships by internet, you know, the safety is automatically in.